I just want to start by asking you whether you think this crisis has in any way fundamentally changed the economic or will, will change the economic system. Are we making structural changes as a result of what's happening? Well, we will do foolish things again. I mean, it, it is human destiny. There's no way that you take, you know, six and a half billion humans in the world or 309 billion in the United States or any other, any other uh, subdivision you want to take, you're going to get, and you're going to do it in your, in your, at your own household. I mean, it, it goes all the way. People do foolish things. And even smart people do very foolish things. And uh, we won't get rid of that. We've got to try and protect as much as possible the foolish things that I do from impacting too many other people. Uh, and that's the job of government. And, and uh, uh, we'll come out of this a little smarter on that, but we won't, it won't be enough smarter so that we avoid troubles in the future. But you famously described um, derivatives as uh, financial weapons of mass destruction. Do you think, looking back on it, that they contributed to what happened significantly? I think you had given the warning that they were going to. Yeah. Do you think, in the end, they did? Oh, I think they, they did. I don't think they were the sole cause at all, but, but they did because of two things. They, they increase leverage dramatically in a way that people can't even measure, either as to individual institutions or as to the system, and, and they, but it's dramatic nevertheless. And then they increase interconnectedness, and, and it's, uh, you know, you can go back to the days of bank runs and all of that sort of thing. I mean, it, what happens at one financial institution affects another, and the system keeps trying to develop ways to insulate that connectivity and, and the domino effect, but uh, derivatives increased it uh, very significantly. And of course, just in the case of Lehman, you can, you can trace through some of that. To tell me what you think about that public, that visceral public reaction. So Fred Goodwin, the, ch the chief executive of Bank of Scot Royal Bank of Scotland, he, he, he goes bust on his watch, basically. Yeah. Well, it, what, it's infuriating. I can speak more about the American public, but it's infuriating to people to see them the friend, their friends losing their jobs in terms of seeing their friends having their houses foreclosed upon, whatever it may be, and nobody going to jail. I mean, uh, you know, it, it was one thing in Enron, at least, you know, you had Skilling and Kenley and, you know, or WorldCom or those things. You had, you, society at least felt there was a little bit of vengeance taking place, but here nobody's going to jail. In fact, a lot of them are walking off with, with tons of money, which they got in many cases with preferential tax terms. So. You know, the American public's uh, exasperation at this is very understandable. On the other hand, I will say this. Last September and October, our public officials, the key ones, uh, and, and particularly Chairman Bernanke, but Secretary Paulson, too, what they did was absolutely essential to uh, the, the system even surviving. If we were on a ship and it, it, it was, there was a shipwreck. We all swam to an island. We knew we'd never be rescued. And there were 50 of us there. And fortunately, it was, it, was a, it was a fertile island so we could all plant rice and grow enough to take care of ourselves. We would not take the five smartest people out of the 50 and tell them, why don't you start trading rice futures, you know, and speculating on yourself. And by the way, we think that's so valuable. We're going to give you the most money and probably a favorable tax rate on top of it. Hell no. You know, we get everybody producing rice. And the idea that the people that move money around are some favored class, and they are in this country, even in terms of taxes, uh, you know, strikes me as getting pretty far away from <laughs> where we should be. After many, many years of success, the success breeds its own success, that people are begging you to invest in them, and they'll give you fantastic terms. Is that true? Do you, do you well, think it's better for you? you? Do you think you can get better terms than I can? I, I can get better terms than you can. Well, not, that's really not true. I mean, it, when we got good terms, for example, in making our Goldman Sachs or General Electric investment, that wasn't because we could get better terms. It's because we had money when nobody else had it and, and could come up with that kind of money. Uh, so if you want to invest $100,000 or a $1 million, you're, you're probably going to get a better deal than I am because you can look at the whole universe of investments and you can find things where your $100,000 or $1 million will have an impact. I have a very small universe now. So Why, six, because you're so big. You yeah, just, so, so I've, got, I've, only got, I've only got a few hundred things I can look at, tops, and you've got thousands. And, and so uh, success in certain ways breeds its own success. Success in other ways breeds its own failure. I mean, there is, you cannot compound very large sums of money at the same route, rate that you can compound small amounts. If I were working with a very small amount of money, I would get higher returns now. 
in terms of percentages, but uh, you know, it's a high class problem to have of having too much money. <laughs> what is the taxpayer meant to make now of the fact that Goldman Sachs is, or at least for the last few months, has been highly profitable? And in a way, the taxpayers aren't seeing much of the upside return. The company wouldn't exist if it hadn't been for them. Well, but, they wouldn't, they, they, but that's, that's true of, you know, the McDo local McDonald's stand. I mean, everything was threatened by that. So, so it wasn't a question of, it was a question of saving the system. And Goldman Sachs was not a particularly weak pillar in the system at all. Uh, it, so it wasn't like they needed to be punished. And the, and the taxpayer has done actually quite well uh, with the Goldman investment. Uh, and you can look at the, the some of them, like the city groups or the AIGs or those that the, the, the taxpayer, and I'll get to that in a second, really the taxpayers bailed them out, but the government's bailed them out. And, and they may have bailed them out, but they're down 90% or something like that. So I would say that moral hazard is, uh, is not a huge problem when the people on the equity side lost 90% of their money or Freddie, May, uh, Freddie Mac or, or Fannie Mae, more than 90% of their money. That... I would not worry about moral risk, uh, moral hazard popping up uh, because of those activities. The taxpayer literally hasn't bailed out anybody. We have not had a tax increase in the United States. Our tax receipts are way down this year. They, the lenders to the United States government have been bailing them out. So you can say that if the Chinese and Japanese and so on are buying our government bonds, they are the ones whose money has gone into these institutions. Yeah, the taxes will come now, surely, won't they? We're going to have five years of, seven years of famine after... <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> the very liquidity of stock markets causes people to focus on price action. If you buy an apartment house, if you buy a farm, if you buy a McDonald's franchise, you, you don't think about what it's going to sell for tomorrow or next week or next month. You think about how is this business going to do. But stocks with this huge liquidity suck people in and they turn what should be an advantage into a disadvantage. In fact, people do do it with flats and apartments and houses sometimes, and that's when the market tends yeah, to be Yeah, but most overwhelmingly, yeah, overwhelmingly yeah. they don't. They, they, if, if you buy, a, if you buy a, 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 an apartment house and it has 20 units, you really think about what can I rent these units for, how likely am I to have vacancies, what will my taxes be and my upkeep and all of that, and you compare the net return to how much money you're laying out. That's investment. And the advantage of investment is that ultimately it's the thing that generates social returns, really, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's productive output that, that justify, and, and you can still get in trouble if you pay too much, but, but you are focusing on the right thing if you look at the stream of income that the asset is going to produce over time.